Hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome. Uh, I appreciate you hanging out with me. Justin Hickox here. If you're new to my channel or you're new to me, uh, well, I talk about hair. Typically, what I do is I take you along on a little adventure with me and show you some really cool views and answer questions about hair and hopefully make your hair life a little bit easier. I teach people typically kind of how to do their hair at home, like how to style it, all the questions you kind of come back with when you leave a salon. Um, but I also teach people actually how to cut and color their hair at home, which probably sounds odd considering I'm a stylist. So you think most stylists don't talk to people about that, but I do because especially in the times we find ourselves in right now, it's just a thing. And so for me, I feel like if you're going to go out and you're going to take that into your own hands, I want you to have all the information you possibly can so that you get the best results. So long and the short, that's what I do. So welcome today. I'm going to be answering some common questions, some very common questions I get asked. And uh, yeah, hopefully I'll shed some light on some concerns for you. Um, do me a favor and let me know if you can hear me. Uh, I just want to make sure that everything is going well here because, you know, with these things, you always wonder a little bit. So if you can hear me, throw a little comment below and let me know uh, if everything sounds good. Thumbs up and we'll jump into some questions. Uh, so first of all, I, I asked some questions yesterday. I actually threw up a little post when I said, hey, what are your questions? Uh, throw them out to me. And oh, fantastic. Karen says all good. Thank you, Karen. Um, so I do have some of those questions, but before I dive into those, I want to talk about some very common things that I see all the time on my videos, some questions that everybody seems to want to know. And I want to kind of knock those out of the park first, and then we'll get to some questions that people have asked specifically. And then if you have questions, go ahead and throw them uh, on, on, the, on the comment section here, and we'll jump into those as well. Uh, I, I think there's an option if you want to support the channel, uh, there's a little option to do that. That's fantastic. I always appreciate it. However, with that said, it is never expected. So don't stress it just so you know that option is there either way. So diving into the number one, probably, probably question that I get, probably the number one question that I get, and that is simply, how do you explain to your stylist? what you want. So a lot of times I do videos where I'll explain proper layering, you know, why layers don't work or why they do work and kind of how to avoid those common mistakes, common with mistakes with certain lengths or whatever it is within a specific haircut, common mistakes with creating volume, how to not address fine hair, right? How to be careful about common mistakes uh, that are happen with bob shapes or fine hair or thin hair, or all of that stuff. And when I do those videos, the number one thing that people ask is, well, this is great, but how do I explain this to a stylist? So I'm going to break down what I would do or, and what I would explain um, or what I would want maybe from a client uh, and hopes that it will kind of shed some light on that. But before I say it, you kind of have to understand that this is a little bit of a broad answer. And it's tough because there isn't one specific way to explain things to different stylists. All different stylists have different terminology. What one stylist may call layering, I might call beveling right? Or whatever. So we have different words. And this is why I always lean to photos. So what I normally would say is if you have something that you're concerned of or that you want with your hair, first things first is determine what you want. Now, I know a lot of times it's, well, that's what I want my stylist for is to figure out what I want. I don't know what I want. Uh, just a heads up next week, I will be actually or this coming Tuesday, uh, I am uploading a video for longer hair um, that will help you understand how to determine what direction you should head in. So to give you some ideas, a little three-step process I have that will walk you into like how you actually figure out what you should do if you want to change your hair, a good way to move, and then you can figure out how to personalize that for you. But with that said, I would always have some direction ahead. When you go to a stylist, don't sit down and say, I don't care what you do, do whatever. That's the first thing. And the reason that is dangerous is because if they actually do whatever they want, who's to say you're going to like it? It might look great on you. It might look great to everybody else. But at the end of the day, if you don't feel comfortable in it, whether it looks good or not is, is mildly irrelevant. You need to be comfortable in what you want. So therefore, your stylist needs to know what your boundaries are. And then we can work within those boundaries to determine what's going to function the best for you based on your needs, your day-to-day -day maintenance, and how you feel comfortable and what you like and what you don't like and all of these things. But we need to know, for instance, what's too short? What's too long? Is there anything you've had in the past that you don't want? 
I always say bring photos with you. So even if you don't have a style in mind, bring photos of things that you like and don't like. Maybe you like the bangs on this photo, but you hate the length of the bangs. I like how thick they are, but they're too short or they're too long. Maybe you like the way they're swept off, but maybe you would like to change it a little bit. Maybe you like the length on one photo, overall length, but the layers seem too short and they're too choppy. Maybe you love the photo all around. It's just a great shot, but you're not sure if it's going to work for you. Bringing in things that you like and don't like, all it does for a stylist is it gives us a visual reference so that we know that the terminology used is correct. It's, it's, it's the same between both of us simply because it's no terminology. It's a visual reference. The minute we start talking about things that we've heard from other stylists or that we heard or read in a magazine, that's when things can be dangerous because of those differences in verbiage. So we want to make sure that if you're going to go into a stylist, when you're trying to explain what you want, start by explaining what you don't want, because many times that's more impactful than what you do want. I don't want it shorter than this. In the past, I've had layers that made it feel really thin at the bottom. I don't want that. I don't want this stuff down here too layered because it starts to feel thin. I don't want my layers too short because they start to feel too much like a mullet. I don't want too many bangs because too many bangs makes me feel closed off and it's just too much for me, right? Start walking through what you don't like and then start walking through what you do like. Realistically, when you go to a stylist, in my opinion, the stylist should be asking a lot of questions because we can't get the answers necessary to, to determine what you want to do without having questions to ask to get said answers. So we should be asking those questions, but many times we don't. Right, Stylists don't know maybe to ask the questions or they were never taught to ask the questions. And that is what it is. So it just means that the ball kind of gets rested in your court. And that means that you have to bring up those questions or the answers to those questions proactively. Because if you rely on the stylist too and they don't, then there's a lot of room for misconception. And that's when typically things will start going wrong. So unfortunately, as much as I would love to just say, hey, Go to a stylist. We're all going to ask the same thing. We're all going to do it the same way. And we're going to ask enough questions to get the answers you need. Don't stress it. That clearly isn't the case. So it becomes on your shoulders, unfortunately, to take that into your own reign and say, okay, I'm going to start giving them the answers. They should be asking me what I like, what I don't like, how I style my hair every day, how much maintenance I want to make, you know, or I want to spend on, right? What do I, how often do I want to come to the salon? How often do I want to do my hair? Am I shampooing every day? Am I shampooing every other day? They should be asking all these questions to pull that information from you. But if they don't ask it, then you explain it. And if you can explain it, that's how you explain between the photos of what you like and you don't like, the direction you want to head, and then explaining what you do to your hair. And again, the things that you like and you don't like and your frustrations and all that, that's the best way that you have the best opportunity to get what you want out of the stylist. So as a very blanket answer to that very common question, that's the way I would approach it. Of course, each individual situation is going to be individual. And that's why I can't give you an individual answer because it's so, it's so specific. So with that said, do that. Now, how do you find the right stylist so that you know who to bring these answers and questions to? There's a few different ways, but there's a couple ways that I want to share with you that I think will, uh, you might not know of that will help. So first is to go to a website called, and this is, I wish I could put this on the screen, but called intercoiffure, I N T. E-R-C-O-I-F-F-U-R-E, -I, -F -F -E. I know, intercoiffure.com. It's a group of hairstylists and salons. It's considered to be one of the top group of the, like the top half of 1% of salons and stylists in the world. It, we got accepted in like 1980, I shouldn't say we, and I did not get accepted. My parents' salon was accepted in like 1980 something or whatever, and my only claim to fame with that whole thing is that because of their acceptance, I was able to see what happened when you became part of that group and the necessary requirements to become part of it and all of the hair shows and the education and the access to educate, being educated by top salons and all the requirements to be part of that group. And because of all of that, I can say that, yes, it is a, it's not the only stylists out there that are good, but it is a pretty solid option that if you find a salon that's an intercoiffure salon, you're going to be dealing with some top-end stylists. And that means that their education program is going to be very similar. When we got accepted, you had to have an apprenticeship program. 
So you couldn't be, your salon had to be large enough to begin with, and you had to have an apprenticeship program. So people couldn't just come in and go to the floor. They had to go through advanced training before they were allowed to cut hair on the floor. That means that your education level is going to be a little bit more stringent before you're allowed. Does that make sense? I don't know that it made sense, but I hope you got what I was saying. But the education process is going to be a little more stringent before you're allowed to start cutting hair. And then the ongoing education, because you have access to these elite stylists, you start bringing these other stylists in to train your team on advanced techniques. And that's why it's a really solid group of folks. So if you go to that website, you can look around your area and find salons that are part of that. Then what I would do is I would call those salons and I would say, hey, when you find one near you, I want a senior stylist that is an expert in whatever your hair is. I want a senior stylist that does really amazing bobs. I want a senior stylist that colors hair um, really well to bring it back to gray. I want a senior stylist that specializes in blondes, right? Somebody like that. Senior stylist just means that they're typically been on the floor long enough that they would have an apprentice. And usually to get an apprentice, you have to be book solid enough to warrant having an apprentice. And that means that you've built a clientele, which means that you've been long there long enough and you're good enough to build that clientele. You've got good client retention, which means you're taking care of people. People are happy. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on with that. So senior stylist, keep that in mind. And I know that's going to be hard to find. I apologize. Maybe I'll try to get that in, into the description below uh, when, when this gets all said and done. Okay, so uh, jumping into some other questions because I don't want to miss these two. I don't want to just talk about the normal questions. Um, let's see here. I've got some of these that I just screenshotted here. Um, okay, so from the question from the uh, the post that I made yesterday. Um, let's see. The first question is uh, S M uh, asks tips for cutting and styling curly hair. So. It depends on if you're talking about cutting from my perspective or cutting from your home perspective. If you're doing it at home, then the process that I use, the process that I teach in, in my master class for the different haircuts would actually be the same. Um, and it really depends on the haircut. So it really, you know, it's, it's up to you. I guess one tip that I could give you would be that uh, you would want to make sure that when you actually are gauging your length that you want, gauge your length dry. So style your hair get it dry, and then gauge the length. How much do you want this length to come up? Well, let's say it's down here. You want it to come to the collarbone, and that's this much. Well, look at that amount, and then when you get it wet and you're pulling that down, then you cut off that amount. You don't cut it to where you want it to be. That's simply because it's going to cinch up. Um, as far as if, like if you're behind the chair and you're a stylist and you're cutting curly hair, uh, some simple tips I would have to say is always obviously – allow for the cinching up of the curl. Okay. That's like the basic thing that goes for both cutting it at home and at, at, uh, at your home at, and at salon. Um, the, as far as doing it dry or wet, that's a very personal thing. I prefer cutting hair wet, curly hair wet at the salon. A lot of people say that they prefer to do it dry because they can see the curl patterns better. I personally like it. I actually like to do it wet. I still feel like I can see the curl pattern well enough. And then I can detail things when it's dry. So for me, it's easier to get a clean line and a strong overall, what I'd call a perimeter, right? So the base length and the front layers, I can get all of that stuff really strong and even when it's wet because I can comb through it and I can pull it out. And yes, tension means it's going to pop up when it's dry, but I also account for that when I'm looking at it dry and determine how short we want to cut it or how much length I'm taking off. So all of that stuff is accounted for. So for me, I can comb it down wet, cut it. However, I need to cut it. I know how much I'm taking off. I know what I'm getting rid of. And I can give it a really strong perimeter, which gives it a really strong foundation. That's the way I choose to do it. Um, one thing I would say is be very careful. If you're deciding, if you're doing it at the salon and you're going to use a razor, be very careful. There's a lot of people out there that like shun the razor when it comes to curly hair. And I totally understand that. The thing we have to understand about razors and curly hair is that razors used one way, like strip the hair away into nothing. And what that means is, instead of cutting a blunt line, right? And just boom, it cuts this line. It just takes those hairs and it strips them away into nothing. And that can translate as frizz or uncontrollable curl. That's the concern. Not, it's a way you use the razor. That's not razors. I can use a razor and cut a very blunt edge that would mimic using straight shears. 
the reasoning behind using a razor in that scenario is because sometimes it's easier to cut front layers with the razor that way than it is to get my shears in there and cut it. Sometimes I just have more of a visual reference. It's, it's easier for me and it may be easier for you. If so, just know that you don't want to strip the hair away. You're using that more like the edge of a shear and you're just kind of cutting it away. I don't know if that helps at all, but <laughs> I hope so. So as far as cutting curly hair, just pay attention to the fact that it's going to cinch up. And then realistically, there's so many little nuances to it. It's really, it is a bit of a case on case um, sensitive scenario. And because you're going to be dealing with multi-textural curly hair, some curl and more in some, more in some areas, less in other areas. So it really does become a little bit of a personalizing thing after it's dry, but also realize that after it's dry and it's styled and you cut little areas, the next time it styles, it's not going to style exactly the same way. It's curly hair. So each individual curl is going to be a little bit different. So those pieces that you're cutting could end up shorter or longer. That may not be what you want. Another reason that I actually prefer doing it wet, at least I know that it's going to be relatively easy, even more often than not. But that's a personal thing, like I said. And so whatever works best for you is what I'm behind when it comes to that. Um, so uh, Sean Super Shine says, my hair is dyed blonde, but tends to get brassy. Uh, is it worth it getting color correction and keeping up with it from that point onward? Blonde and brass is like the biggest concern. I mean, like that's the number one thing I see. If we're talking about blonde and the blonde is not correct, it's because it's either too brassy from the get-go or because it was great when at home, you showered a couple times and then the next thing you know, your ends get brassy or your, the whole thing gets brassy and it's like, what do I do with this brass? As far as whether or not it's worth it for you to continue doing the blonde and trying to cut the brass, um, that's kind of a personal question. You know, it, it, it really depends on the person. I've got clients that we can highlight their hair or color their hair, do it blonde. Then we typically tone it to get it to the right color because it's not always the perfect blonde right out of the gate, right? So you got to tone it a little bit. And then that toner will fade. And some, it lasts a while. Some, it goes quicker. It depends on iron content in your water. It depends on day-to-day -day maintenance, like what you're doing to your hair. It depends on if you're using purple shampoos. I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into what can make that, cause that brassiness. So depending on your um, willingness to deal with that maintenance, that's what's going to determine whether or not it's worth it for you. Also, I would actually, I would question how much is that maintenance damaging your hair? Is it a damage, is it a damaging your hair to an extent where it's not worth it simply because your hair, even though it's the color that you want, it doesn't really have any sort of life and it's not functioning really as a shape or as hair. It's just kind of there and you don't like the end result, even though you like the color. If that's the scenario, then I would say, I don't care if you like the color or not, just don't do it because you're not getting the result that you really want. You want hair that you has a shape and a style that you love and has the tone that you like or a shape and a style that you love and has a tone that you can manage. But if getting the tone that you want just negates all of the other, you know, shape and style and all that stuff, that's just flat hair. That's a bright, that's a kind of a pretty color. And that might not be the thing that suits you. Or if you love that, cool, but it really is kind of a personal decision. Sorry. I can't give you more specifics on that. Um, and there's so, like I said, there's so many different factors that go into that, that it's, it really is. It's tough to give you like one little thing. Purple shampoo is a great option right? Making sure that if you've got hard water, trying to get something to soften your water, that will help. Especially if you're like out in the middle of nowhere and you've got well water, that's a nightmare. Don't smoke. I mean, <laughs> for a host of different reasons, and I'm not here to stand on the soapbox, but for a host of different reasons, but smoking turns white hair yellow. It's not cute. Um, or being around people in smoking environments, that will do it as well. And be careful about using, sorry, be careful about using clarifying shampoo just to cut all that stuff out because clarifying shampoo too often can damage your hair. It's too strong for your hair. So don't rely on that as a crutch to try to pull any of that buildup or that yellow buildup out of your hair. Um, okay, so Suna Govind, I'm so sorry if I destroyed that name. I apologize. Uh, she says, hey, Justin, love you. Love you right back. Thank you. Uh, I'm really confused about dyeing my hair and what color is best for me. Uh, well, what color is best for you is going to be based a lot on one, what you like, um, but also your skin tone, your underlying skin tone. So not rather how tan you are, right? Because we change how tan we get throughout the year. So we might be, I'm, I'm pretty pale in the summer and the wintertime and in the summertime I get quite dark, right? So that's going to change, but my underlying skin tone is going to stay the same. And that is typically 
neutral, cool, or warm. Neutral is going to be somebody that is, really can wear any sort of base tone. So all colors have a specific base to them. And that base, that undertone, is basically going to be cool or warm. And that cool base, so like think when you think cool, think ashy, think, um, think you know, I don't want to say gray, green, ash, it doesn't sound pretty, but the cooler, bluer, less warm, red, orange, yellow, less of that stuff, and think more of the blue and greens, right? When you have a base of a color, and it doesn't mean that it is blue, it might be a brown, but you're, you can have browns that have a blue or a green or an ashy undertone. You can have browns that have a warm or a red or a gold undertone. Same level of color, same brown. They just have a very different hue to them, okay? If you have a, a cool skin tone or a neutral skin tone, then you're going to be able to wear some cooler colors. And now, heads up, there's going to be stylists that tell you the opposite of this, okay? So some stylists will say, if you've got cool skin, you need to wear warm colors, warm undertone colors. If you've got warm skin, you need to wear cool undertone colors. I lean to the other way and a lot of stylists will agree with me and a lot of stylists will disagree with me. I'm sure that does not help you at all, but this becomes an opinion. I personally find if you have cooler skin tone, you work better with cooler colors. And if you look at your natural color, many times you'll likely see that it is a little bit cooler, right? It's because it's natural and usually our natural color, hair color, tends to work well with our skin tone. So kind of keep that in mind. If you have a neutral skin tone, you can go both ways. A very simple way to determine what your skin tone is, is just simply asking yourself what color jewelry you wear. Now there are other tests that can help really narrow this down. I actually have an entire webinar that we teach, that we go through, it's a free webinar. I think there's a link to it actually in the description of this video as well if you wanna check it out. Um, but we go through home hair mistakes, like mistakes that people make at home when they're doing their color and cut. And one of the things we explain is how to determine your skin tone because doing the wrong color for your skin tone is a big problem. So one simple way though, is just look at your jewelry. If you wear a lot of silver jewelry, you've likely got a cool skin, uh, a cool undertone. If you wear a lot of gold, you've likely got a warmer undertone. If you feel equally as comfortable in gold or silver and you flip them back and forth, you're likely neutral, right? So keep that in mind. I hope that helps. Um, and I will guys get to your questions up here. So don't forget uh, they are there and I do see them. Um, okay, Heather Fabris, Fabris, I hope that's right, Heather. <laughs> Uh, it says, hey, Justin, I watched all your videos, thank you, about creating a cut that will re result in volume. I have asked for layers before, and the way my stylist cuts it, it's always flat on top and bows out at the bottom. Can you tell me the words to use to explain to my hairstylist how to get the layering effect to pump up the volume on top? Love your channel. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, so this goes a little bit back to the question that I answered at the very beginning on kind of how to explain things to your stylist. Um, and the, the reason I can't give you specific words is because it literally could be a foreign language to that stylist. The weird thing is you would think, and in some cases, there are some kind of universal terms when it comes to hair, right? Some specific things, layering, front layering, bangs, right? Bobs, stuff like that, that any stylist is going to know. But then there's some layering techniques or some words that people use to describe certain kinds of layering that I'm like, what the hell is that? I've never heard of that. And then when they explain it, I realize, oh, well, you call it that, I call it this, because that was the method I was taught, or that's the way the person that taught me called it, right? When there's not a lot of volume on top, the tough thing is what I would do, since you can't use real words to explain exactly what technique they need to use, the easier way may be is to try to determine why it's laying flat on top. And realistic, or usually what I find is if it's laying flat on top, it's a result of one of two things. Either the layers are too long, in which case they're too heavy and they're just not getting the volume, or oddly enough, they're too short, in which case if they're too short, what will happen is you'll get a little bit of volume, it'll lay in at the top, and then because of the length and the fullness on the sides, it'll have a tendency to get a little bit fuller on the sides and it'll collapse, this little cup of volume will collapse right there, and it looks flat because the sides get more volume, the flat looks top, and you don't actually have enough length to create bend that creates volume. So that would be one thing. One thing I would shy away from is going in and saying, hey, I don't feel like I get enough layer, uh, uh, volume on top. My layers are too long. Cut them shorter. Okay. You want to make sure that they're too long first. So how would we do that? An easy way to do that is take the hair out your occipital bone right here, okay, that bump in the back of your head, and pull it up. Now, when you pull that hair up, 
Then grab with your other hand a, a hair from the top of your head. Pull that up. If the hair on the top of your head is the same length as the hair that's coming from your occipital bone or shorter, you do not want to take those layers on top any shorter. Likely they are too short already if they're shorter than that hair from the occipital bone and that's what's creating the problem. If they're longer than that hair, then you could say, hey, these are a little bit too long. Can we take them a little bit shorter? So that would be one way to address it is just to figure that out for yourself at home. Is this too long on top? And if it is, take those a little bit shorter, but I don't want them too short. If they're that same length or shorter, you don't want them to go any shorter. Be very careful about that. Then likely what's going on is it could be too full on the sides and the fullness on the sides is creating the illusion that it's flatter on top. Another option would be that Honestly, they haven't, and this is going to sound bad, so don't take this the wrong way, but they haven't shown you how to style it correctly. Maybe the product that you're using isn't giving you enough foundation to create the volume. A, a haircut is a foundation, but without building on that foundation, there's really nothing there. It's the same reason that like, start clean, perfectly clean hair is a nightmare. You can't work with it because it just doesn't have any... All products do is create your hair or create a dirty feeling, a dirty texture without the greasy oil typically. So that's the goal is to create a dirtier texture so that your hair has texture to get volume and get control and shape without the oil base of a grease. I think that makes sense, right? Yeah. The oil base of a grease, which just lays your hair flatter. So kind of keep that in mind. I hope that helps. I'm going to jump to a couple questions on here real quick just so that I don't miss them. Uh, let's see. Dory says, uh, washing hair once a week, good or bad, should it be different in the winter? That is a great question. It's going to be very dependent on your oil production of your scalp, how much oil your scalp is producing, and your tolerance to that oil. Once a week is not bad at all. In the United States, we are taught that we need to be shampooing our hair on a day-to-day -day basis, and that is absolutely not true whatsoever. There are a lot of people that will tell you not shampooing your hair at all, ever, is actually really good for your hair. There's a lot of people that say just using conditioner is really good for your hair. There's a lot of, of, of talk about a lot of different things surrounding shampoo. For me personally, I base it because I don't think it's quite as simple as people try to make it in terms of being just broad. I base it more on the individual because depending on how much product you're using in your hair on a day-to-day -day basis to style it, how often you're styling your hair with said product, what product you're using because how much buildup that potentially can have. There's a lot of factors that are going to go into you being able to cleanse that out and how often you need to be cleansing that out. Once a week is totally fine. As long as you're being able to create the volume that you want to create and your hair doesn't feel too, too, uh, too oily or greasy and feel like if it doesn't bother you, there's nothing wrong with once a week. There's nothing wrong with more than with less than once a week. My mom, I believe shampoos her hair like once, like once every week and a half or almost two weeks. And then she literally just styles her hair in between, which to some may sound completely disgusting and gross. I, I'm not here to judge. <laughs> she never smells. So I guess that's why she always has volume. And people always think her hair is super thick and dense. And it's not, she actually has very fine, thin hair, but you know, she, she doesn't, she doesn't shampoo every day at all. I don't shampoo every day. There's uh, that would be crazy to me. So you're doing fine with once a week, stick with it. Um, when he says, I just, Hey Wendy, what's going on? When he says, Hey Justin, I'm late, but glad I'm here. Well, welcome. Thanks for having, thanks for being here. Uh, see, uh, Diane Walker says, I just need help for gray long layers, tried everything for frizz. So I'm assuming that frizz is the kind of the problem here. Frizz does come. It, it's very different. I did a whole video on the, the process and why frizz happens and how to manage it. If you haven't checked that out, definitely check it out because frizz is, it seems like it would just be the simple answer. And it's so, it's like, seriously, like figuring out frizz is like an allergy test. You know how you go in for an allergy test and it's like, okay, we need to like prick you with 700 things and test you. Like you got to eat this one thing this week and then not eat it for like the next, it's, it's crazy. Okay. Is what I'm getting at. I'm not a doctor, so I can't even give you a proper analogy, but it's crazy how many things that you wouldn't expect that will create or take away frizz. So the problem, or not the problem, but the, the hardest part about creating, uh, about answering your question would be, we have to first determine what creates the frizz. Is it your hair texture? Is it because it's going gray? Is it changing because of the product you're using? Is it a hormonal change? Is it because of the moisture levels? Are you, you could be drying your hair outside in a high moisture area, like in a high humid area, right? Dry it outside, get it smooth. 
go inside where there's air conditioning and it feels like it's a much drier air. And all of a sudden your hair will have frizz because it's trying to balance out the moisture. It's, it's really kind of nuts. So simple answers. Um, anything that's going, so typically speaking, and this may not be the answer you want to hear, but typically speaking, heat can control it um, on, you know, like in most cases, flat iron, stuff like that. I know that they get to balance that, right? Because there's damage that it creates too. That's a whole nother like bag of worms that I could get into about damage. We'll, we might get into that here in a little bit, but I will just say that I have clients that use flat irons. My ex-girlfriend used a flat iron hair literally every single day, long, straight, thick, black hair. Every single day, her hair was curly. She'd dry it straight every day. You never in a million years would know that her hair was ever touched with a flat iron. So it's not to say that just because you use a flat iron, you're inherently going to have hair that falls out and it's horribly damaged. There's a lot of factors that go into damage. If I'm completely honest, while a flat iron is one of those factors, it's not as crucial or it's not as concerning as a lot of other factors that people have no idea that's even going on that they do on a day-to-day -day basis. So just kind of keep that in mind. If you're really just determined, look, I need to get rid of this fridge. What do I do? That's one way. Okay. So heat, not curling irons flat irons because of the way they deliver heat because they have two plates each side and it covers the entire expanse of the hair follicle. Now, another way would be through product, um, usually oil based products, but the amount of oil based to them will change. So when you look and we'll, I think there's another question about this as well that we'll cover, but quick oversight. When you look at most pomades or oils, the amount of oil based watery texture to you that they have, will determine how greasy they are and how much shine they give and how much control they have. When I say control, I mean being able to control frizz. Typically speaking, products that are really oily, like very watery, they don't have a lot of control, they're gonna give a lot of shine. Because they don't have a lot of control, they're not gonna be able to control that frizz quite as well, but they're gonna give your hair a lot of shine, but also they can weigh your hair down because they're so greasy or oily. Typically the products that have a, are a lot stickier, more like a clay or something like that, um, but still give the hair shine. They have a much less of an oil base. They're going to give your hair a lot more control, much less shine, but somewhere in between there, you're going to find a consistency of a wax that will help to actually be strong enough to smooth some of that, that texture out, but not be so oily that it ends up just weighing your hair down and, and ends up with a greasy. Sprays can do that too. It really depends on how much frizz is going on really and what it's being caused from. So I know that's a very blanket answer. It's not hyper specific. I apologize, but there's just, unfortunately, without seeing you specifically, there's no specific answer. That was a lot of specifics. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me jump back in here real quick. Uh, let's see. Uh, SM says, hi, what are your favorite products to create volume? Thanks. So I actually did a whole, uh, I did a whole video on this. So let me back this up a second. If you followed me at all, if you know me at all, you know, by this point, I would hope that like I have my own product line. Okay. Now with that said, just because I have my own line, I am not the stylist or the person that thinks, well, just, it's got my name on it. So it's the best. No, there are a lot of really good products out there. And my number one game 25 years ago, when I started cutting hair has always been client needs first sales second. I don't like sales. It's not, I don't like pushes. It's not me as a person. I just think it's icky and it doesn't work for me. Some people it works great for, but I don't like it. I have always been under the, under the thought process that I want you to use as my client, whatever is going to make your hair work the best for you, because ultimately it's going to make my job a whole lot easier. Right. And it's going to make you happier. It's going to up my client retention because I was actually able to give you a product that worked for your hair that you love. You're going to tell people, you're going to come back to me. You're going to tell your friends. This is how I grow a clientele. It's how I've always done it. I have a volume product that honestly, I believe is the best I've ever used of any product out there so far, period. There are a lot of great volumizing products. Styling cream from Bumble and Bumble was fantastic. Gives your hair a lot of volume, but it also has a lot of texture. It means that if you don't like the feeling of product in your hair, you probably will feel like it's a little too much for your hair. I use fat hair. There's actually a link to that in the description of this video as well. Um, you can find it on hickoxstudio.com. It's my website. But I use fat hair because fat hair gives me a lot of volume with very little control. I would say if you're going to try it, watch the video I did. I, I think I titled like my favorite video, my favorite volumizing product because the way you use it is specific. It's also my favorite product for diffu diffusing curly hair, which I'll probably do a video on at some point too, sooner than later to show people you have to know how to use it. But if you use it, it gives you this great ringlet curl without the crunchy wet look. It's 
Absolutely. We did not develop it for that at all, but it works better than anything I've seen so far. And I've tried a lot of other curly hair products just to test them to see, because there's a long time that I didn't know fat hair worked for it. Because again, we did not develop it for curly hair at all. And then randomly we used it one day. I don't remember even who started it. They used it on somebody with, with curly hair to diffuse their hair. And we were like, Oh my, what the, what? And it was that kind of response. So short of your answer is fat hair is honestly my favorite, not because it's mine, but simply because it's what's worked the best for me. And I just haven't found anything that I like more. And it's hands down our crowd favorite people come in, they buy it literally by the dozen because they don't want to run out. Like that's just how it's been for 20 years. Um, okay. Let's see. Robin says, hi, Justin, what is a good product to use before blow drying your hair to help with frizzy, badly damaged hair from overprocessed highlights? Um, a lot of products out there make your hair look greasy and dull. This is kind of what I was talking about, about the earlier, um, oils, oil bases stuff. Um, greasy and dull. Thanks for all the wonderful tips and information. You're a hair guard. You're, you're too much. Thank you. I appreciate you. Um, so as far as smoothing hair out, so this, like I said before, if you saw the last question um, about how, how to deal with frizz, oil-based products, um, that's basically where you're going to be. Let me, let me just, that's what you're going to end up using, but you're looking for something I'm assuming by this, that's going to maybe protect your hair um, as well. Most all products, if there's a barrier, are going to do a really decent job of protecting your hair. Okay? The thing about protection products when it comes to heat protection is typically it's more important the way they're used, the way they're applied, than the product themselves. Typically what happens is people will put a product in their hair and they put it at the scalp and they're done. And then they dry their hair. Well, there's no product from the mid raft, from the mid raft, from the mid shaft all the way to the ends. There's just nothing there. So it's just hair that's unprotected. But most protecting agents, spray and stuff like that, are going to be products that are worked through the mid shaft all the way to the ends and at the roots. And therefore, they're offering more of an even protection simply because they're applied differently. Yes, there are some heat protectant aspects to them too. But with that said, if you just spray that at the root or applied that to the root and didn't apply it from the mid shaft to the ends, it's still not going to protect your hair. So one thing, first things first, is just make sure that you're applying whatever heat protectant you're using correctly. Make sure that you're applying whatever product you're using correctly. I would argue that in most scenarios, and this is not every time, 95% of the time, applying whatever product you're using for whatever you want it to create from the roots through the mid shaft to the ends is going to work better than just at the roots or just at the ends even, right? So even if it's an oil-based product and you're like, I just want to smooth out my ends, working that even a little bit, not a lot, starting at the ends and then working it through is going to give your hair more shine. It's going to give your hair more smoothness. And it's not going to, if you use it appropriately, it's the right product. I understand there's a lot of factors in here, but if you use it appropriately, it's not going to make your hair over greasy overly greasy. So first things first is just make sure that you're using whatever product you're using correctly, because that's going to be more important, honestly, in this scenario than the product you're using. There are a ton of oil based products that are going to help smooth that hair out. Um, and really like there's so many out there that are good that I don't have one specific. I used to have actually one in our own line called Silk Therapy. It was great. Um, one of the product, one of the ingredients and it became, but we can't get it anymore. So I no longer have that. And I haven't found one, honestly, that I like above everything else. So usually if it's your client sitting in my chair, I would usually use an oil on you. We have an oil, um, but it's, I don't honestly think that it's more amazing than a lot of oils out there. There are a lot of different kinds of oils, like the Amazon oils and stuff like that. They're all very, most of them are all very similar and they're all, they all can be great. Mine's great. Lots of them are great. So find an Amazon oil, something like that. The key would be, you know, um, if it's a little bit thicker than an oil, it's going to be even better. It's more like a lotion. Okay. That's gonna, just because it's typically going to have a little bit less oil to it. Therefore, it's going to be a little bit less heavy. So, you know, there's that I would kind of look for, but I don't, it's more of a type of product than it is a specific product. So look for something like that. But I honestly don't have one that I use specifically that I think is better than all of the rest. I would say find something like a lotion and then make sure that you're using it correctly so that you get the actual protection out of it. And then they should smooth your hair down pretty well. I know that wasn't a great answer. I apologize. <laughs> okay. I'm going to jump back here so I don't miss all of these questions as well. Um, let's see. So um, how long, okay. So XD Johnson says, how long should my hair be to get a, 
a bowl cut. <laughs> I was looking at that and I read blow cut and I was like, what is like a flow beat? Like what is a blow cut? <laughs> a bo how long should my hair to be to get a bowl cut? Well, I guess it depends on how long you want it to, to be. I mean, a bowl cut by nature is literally just shaved, almost undercut, but not undercut, right? So shaved up and then wherever that line, wherever you want that to go. Um, I would say if you're going to do a bowl cut or something like that, then leaving that, that line in the back to the occipital bone. So nothing below that, or you could do below it, but just nothing above it. Once you start shaving hair above this bone, it starts to, it, it's not like you're trying to blend a bowl cut anyway. Well, it depends on what kind of bowl cut you're getting because there are different variations, right? But if you're going to do that, typically at the occipital bone or a little bit below is going to blend better if you want any sort of blend in that line. But ultimately, even if you don't want to blend in the line, if you were literally going to put a bowl in your head and shave everything below it, you would still want that bowl to go to the occipital bone or below the occipital bone in the back. And then the front is really, you know, likely to the recessions, right? But anything below, anything on the side, so anything to the recession or below the recession. And then the rest of the hair would come down, however you want to part it. And there you go. Make sense? Okay. Uh, let's see. Moving on. Uh... Suna says, absolutely appreciate the way you explain everything. Thank you. I appreciate that. I hope I didn't destroy your name. I probably did. Um, let's see. I'm going through these. You guys are way too, you guys are way too nice. So many compliments here. You guys make me, you can make me blush. I, I, probably, I probably won't. <laughs> Never mind. Let's see. I just washed my hair. Okay. So Gabriella says, uh, I just washed my hair after having it straightened, after having it straight after two weeks and it still smells burnt. After I wash it, I have curly hair. Will it ever go away? It's, I mean, honestly, that's a really, really, really good question. Yes, would be my simple answer. It should go away. Even if you burn your hair with, with a literal lighter or something and burn your hair, eventually the smell would go away. Um, but I, it, what did you use to straighten it? I guess would be my question. Did you straighten it with like a flat iron or hot tool or did you have it chemically straightened? If you have it chemically straightened, it would depend on the process that they used whatever whatever straightener they used and there are so many out there that i mean it really depends i will say that typically speaking um so most straighteners if it's a chemical straightener are similar to perms okay they're they're similar in the active ingredients that they use with that said perms if you've ever been a salon around perms they reek it's like it's like it's like gas right like like uh, rotten eggs, it is, it's foul. It'll clear, clear a salon. I walk through the door. If somebody's doing a perm, I'm like, oh, perm's going on. <laughs> Look at that. It's really bad. With that said, the smell typically does go away on perms. You don't like when I have clients that get perms, they come back six weeks later, five weeks later. I don't smell that in their hair anymore until they get another perm. Um, I honestly have never had one myself and I've never been around somebody that had it afterward for an extended period of time. So I honestly don't know how long the smell lasts because I've never had to experience how long the smells last, right? Um, but I do know that they typically go away. So if it was like a chemical straightener or something like that, then the probability is high that it would go away. If it's like a, a flat iron or some sort of heat straightener, um, yeah, it should go away, but I'm, being, I'm surprised it still smells. That would be my, kind of my, my, my bigger concern is trying to figure out why. So yeah, again, sorry, I can't give you a better answer on that. Uh, let's see. Thank you, Kelly. I appreciate that. Kelly says, thank you, Justin, for sharing all of your great ideas and tips. I'm happy with my hair for the first time in decades because I follow your instruction to a T. Thank you. That, that, this is the kind of thing, like, that's the kind of comment that like, that makes my day because knowing that, you know, sometimes I was like, I wonder if this stuff even helps anybody, you know? So hearing that it does, that, that's what makes uh, me want to keep on going. Um, do you recommend any vitamins? I guess so. says, do you recommend any vitamins for hair growth? Are they good? Thank you. Merry Christmas to you as well. Um, this is a really good question. So guys, let's talk about hair health for one second here. Now, again, sorry if you're brand new to me. Um, if you're new on here, my name is Justin Hickox. I, I've done hair for 25 years and on my channel, typically I take you on little adventures. I show you different views and stuff, take you out into the woods and then I teach you about hair. I teach people how to do their hair at home. I teach people how to style their hair, cut their hair, color their hair at home, all of the things, as well as hopefully if you're gonna see a stylist, help you understand more of what's going on with your hair so that you have a better understanding of what to explain to the stylist and how to communicate with them so that you get more of what you want. Um, so that is my goal, just so you know. Uh, as far as uh, when you're talking specifically about vitamins for hair, yes. So one of the things that the unsexy thing that people don't wanna know, I feel like when it comes to hair health, 
is that people typically want some sort of topical solution to what's not a topical problem. Okay? What I mean by that is they want to say, hey, my hair is unhealthy. What can I add to it exteriorly speaking? I think that's a word <laughs> to fix it. And yes, conditioners, right? Protein, stuff like that. Olaplex, rebuilding disulfide bonds. All of that stuff is good, smart, great, do it. But what you have to understand is how important it is to take care of what's going on internally. Our hair does not grow from the ends. It grows from the scalp. And what that's to say is that what's going on inside is going to have just as much, if not more of an impact than what's going on outside. So vitamins as a whole are absolutely important. They're vital to health. Stress, vitamins, nutrients, minerals, all of those things when it comes to hair health are a really, really, really big deal. Obviously, I would prefer for myself, if, and I always say consult the doctor, right? I'm not a doctor. But what I do know is that since vitamins, I do know that they're important. Okay, I know there's specific vitamins that, a, I mean, basically A, B, all of the vitamins, right? Uh, but there's specific vitamins that are even more specific to hair health. They are important. You're always going to find the best versions of those in raw, real foods. Okay? So typically speaking, yes, over-the-counter vitamin supplements and stuff like that will promote um, some sort of hair health because they are giving you some sort of those vitamin, some sort of those nutrients. But ideally, you're, you would find those in real whole foods. And the reason for that is because if you're eating real whole foods and you're trying to consume enough vitamins and minerals from those foods, the probability is high that you're going to be eating healthier as a, in general. So you're going to get a lot more benefit from that. If you're exercising, you're lowering stress through exercise, right? Partly, but you're lowering stress levels. You're taking care of your body from the nutrients you're feeding it. You're paying attention to feeding your body nutrients and not just eating food, right? If you're doing all of those things, you're without question, you're going to see a change in your hair. I don't know if you've ever seen somebody, and this is sad, but if you've ever seen somebody that is heavily drug addicted, I can look out my window and look at somebody and say, yeah, that person, not always, but if you see somebody that's like, whoa, that person is really struggling with some addiction right now. And you can usually look at their hair and their hair is rough and it looks really rough. And it's not always because, you know, of conditions it's because in t they're so toxic that that's just translating and seeing through their hair. I've had people that I've seen that take care of themselves physically, but are still struggling with an addiction and it still comes through in their hair. Like you can see it. So yes, I don't have a specific vitamin over the counter that I recommend, but I absolutely recommend vitamins in general and just paying attention to that. I actually did a whole video, live video about that too. I think you can, yes, I did. Um, it's not even a live video. I think it's just a regular video. So you can check that out too, where I go through all of the important vitamins, why they're important, what they promote, like, you know, all of them. So that's a whole nother video. I could spend here for like three hours and talk about that. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. So Gabriella says it was from a ceramic flat iron. Yeah, that's odd. I don't know why, um, unless it was set at like 450 degrees, uh, 400 degrees. So Gabriella was talking earlier, uh, answering a question about um, her hair smelling burnt from being, being straightened and it had been a couple of weeks and she blow dried it and or round brushed it, sorry, uh, washed it and still was having that problem. And I was trying to figure out what she used to straighten it. Ceramic flat iron. The odd thing is like I use ceramic and ceramic's a great format. Like ceramic delivers heat a lot better than metal. It's going to be less damaging more often than not just because of the efficiency. So it's going to be the route you want to go nine out of 10 times. Uh, Dyson, the Dyson ceramic or the Dyson iron is the only one that's not a ceramic plate that I say is better than ceramic plates, but there's a lot of other technology in that is why I think it's so good. Um, but typically ceramic is great. The only time I've seen ceramic where it actually can melt hair like that, where it's like really tough is if it's like a uh, InfraShine has a ceramic iron that goes to 450 degrees, 450 degrees was originally used um, for protein treatments, right? Or for the chemical straightening treatments, because you needed to actually heat the hair up enough that you could deposit that protein. And usually that was the only time that you use that temperature. And then you kick it down to 400, 400 has basically been on average, 400 is basically like, that's kind of the key heat for most people. It's going to be the most efficient and effective with the least amount of actual damage because you go through the hair one time it's done versus setting it at 300, for instance, and you have to go over it 16 times to get the same look, right? It's time under heat, not just temperature. So keeping that in mind, it could have been that the iron was really hot. Um, regardless of why then, that if it was that, yeah, the smell should go away, but I'm surprised that, 
Um, just make sure that the iron is not 450 degrees. If it's 400, you shouldn't have that problem. Hope that helped. Uh, let's see. Okay, guys, let's see. Uh, um, Betty says, love you. Love you right back. Your videos have helped me so much. Education from professional is key. Thing. Well, thank you. I appreciate you. And, and maybe I'll come to Texas someday. Hey, guys, side note, my wife and I are planning once all this stuff comes down to actually do like a trip, a road trip around the United States. And uh, we'll be stopping in different cities. And my goal, honestly, guys, my goal is that we'll be able to, uh, um, I'll be able to contact different salons in these different cities that we stop, these destinations, and actually do one day of hair. So actually work at the salon and do a day of, of clients um, from that area. And then, which I would open up to the YouTube, you know, to, to the audience here, to you guys, and then actually film makeovers one day and actually just really showcase a salon in your area that's really a great salon. And I wouldn't even be doing the makeover, if I'm honest. I would just basically put the video together. I would um, basically host, if you will, and then really bring light to other incredible stylists out there because there are amazing stylists out there. Trust me, there are stylists out there that I, I can't even hold a candle to that I would look at and be like, I don't know half of what you know. Like, you are amazing. So I definitely don't think that, like, I'm on some sort of pedestal, and I would really like to bring light to all of those folks as well. Um, I think it would be, I think it'd be awesome. So maybe I'll be in Texas. I'm sure we'll be in Texas. I actually went to hair school in Texas. Tony guy, Dallas. Okay. Back to the, back to the questions. <laughs> uh, my hairstylist is on maternity leave. So happy for her. Congratulations to her. That's awesome. Um, with that, how do you find a good stylist? So you're probably just jumping on here a little bit. Guys, if you're just jumping on uh, earlier, I actually talked a little bit about this. I, I don't have a way of typing this in. So I'm going to give you guys, here's a second. Okay. Everybody that's on here, I need you to grab a pen real quick. I'm going to give you a couple of seconds. So grab a pen and a piece of paper, something you can write with. I'm going to spell out an email or a website that I want you to go to, and it's going to help you find stylists. There's a couple different ways to find them, but this is a really solid one. So there's a few of you on here real quick. So I'll give you a couple seconds, and then, uh, yeah, I'm going to grab a little sip of this. I'm going to grab a sip of this. Get a pen, okay? Let me know when you're ready. When you're ready, give me a thumbs up. Throw a little thumbs up down here. Throw a little, I'm in, I'm in. Okay. Okay. www.intercoifure dot I believe it's com. It might be US dot US, but I believe it's dot com. Intercoifure dot com. Intercoifure is the essentially the top half or considered to be the top half of 1% of salons in the entire world. The process to become part of this group is no joke. When my parents, and I've said before, I am not a member of this group. My salon, honestly, my salon is not large enough. You have to meet very specific requirements. And I personally don't want to grow my salon. That's not my goal is to grow this salon with a bunch of employees. My parents had massive day spas. I had one of the largest day spas in the entire United States. I've seen all of that process. I know how it goes. It's just not what I want. I like doing this stuff much more and having a little bit more freedom of time. So I'm not going to jump on that, but my parents became part of it in like 19, early 1980s, 85, I want to say. And for a long time, uh, I mean, they were the only ones in our, in Oregon that were a part of this group. And from being, having access to this group through them, okay, nothing that I did, I'm not that special, <laughs> but through them, I was able to see how the process worked, how their process worked to become, to get involved with it. And it was trips to Paris, multiple trips to sit in front of a board to basically explain why we should even, why they should even consider our salon and what we can give to them. It was legitimate fashion shows in front of a group of stylists, like some of the best stylists in the world to say, can, you know, can we really hold up? Like, is, or, do we know what we're talking about? Can we really do hair the way we say, it? like, there was a lot that went into it. And so everybody that gets in has to go through these processes, not to mention you have to have a salon that's a certain size. You have to have a certain kind of training program. You have to meet very, very stringent requirements for them to even consider to bring you into this group. But then once you have access to the group, you have access to education from the top stylists in the world. So we used to fly out people from all over the United States and all over London 
Irvin Rusk, Anthony Guy Mascolo from Tony and Guy, like all these people, all the big names in hair that you hear, we were able and had access to bring them in to train our staff on different techniques. And that was, that was a huge benefit. And so now the people in that salon, if you go to that website, you can use the tools to see salons near you, search your area and find salons around you. Call those salons and say, hey, whatever hair you have, I want to bob. Hey, I'd like to know, do you have a senior stylist that specializes in bob shapes, specializes in blonde hair, specializes in thick hair, specializes in curly hair, whatever it is. Then when they say yes, I'd like to book a consultation. Go and talk to them first. Make sure you guys get along. Make sure you guys communicate well. But the probability is high for them to become a senior stylist. They've been on the floor long enough. They've built a clientele large enough that they have a good client retention. They have clients coming back. They wouldn't be in this salon if they didn't get good ongoing education. They didn't get on the floor right out of the eight because they had an apprenticeship program. So they had to go through advanced training after they got out of school before they could hit the floor. There's a lot of promising um, factors to the idea that if you go to one of these salons, you're probably going to be in good hands or at least you've got a really good opportunity or a really good um, probability of being in good hands. Now, put that aside. What if you don't want to do that? What if you heads up, these salons typically are going to be a little bit on the pricier side too. That's usually how they're going to function. So what if you just, I want to look for another salon. This is going to sound weird, especially in today's times. Find somebody walking down the street that's got good hair. That's got hair similar to yours. Where do they get their haircut? It's ridiculous, but it works. If you find somebody that's got a style that you want or your hair texture that struggles and you go to their stylist and they love their stylist, you can always go in for a consultation and talk to them and then follow my guide for the consultation, but always talk to them, see if you guys are on the same page. And that's another possible way to figure out somebody that's good. So those are my two things. It's always, not always ask your friend because your friend's stylist may not be good for your hair unless you have the exact same hair texture. So sometimes asking a total stranger that's got your hair texture that you like their cut, that is a better way to go for me. Just don't walk up to them and start touching their hair because that's creepy. I've actually had clients come in and say that people did that. Like, that's weird. Who does that? Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, okay, so Armalame, I really hope I didn't pronounce that wrong. I'm sorry. It says, I have black hair. I use ash blonde hair dye to get a medium dark brown hair and use purple shampoo. It's still too brassy for me. If I use bleach, what toner do you recommend? It's a great question. So it depends on the actual. So usually when we mix up toners, it's not like one toner. More often than not, it's kind of a recipe, if you will, of other toners. So Shades EQ from Redken, Shades EQ. Um, you can actually get it on Amazon. It's great. It's what I use in the salon. It's, it's fantastic. I absolutely swear by it. I love it. But typically speaking, um, when I'm using it, we're, I'm going to use a few different things to create the specific recipe that's going to make most sense for that particular client. So it's honestly, it's kind of tough to say without seeing your hair, which one I would choose. My concern is that I would say, Hey, you know, try nine V or whatever, but not really knowing the level of what you're trying, you know, brown, uh, medium, dark Brown. I mean, to me, that would be like a level five. So, you know, I could give you a reference, but I honestly don't know if that's what it, it might be a level four even to you. Right. I'm, it's just tough to say. So I find shades EQ and uh, as the, as the actual toner brand. And then honestly, they actually have recipes. So what, what, what might be good for you is if you look up shades EQ toner recipe, you'll actually find like little photos with the recipes of like, I use this, 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 and this, you know, these, it's literally like a little food recipe. And then I would look for the photo. That's kind of the tone that you want. And I would use that recipe because it's easier that way than me hoping that I tell you the right one, not having seen your hair at all. So it could be, I could give you the completely wrong answer on that. Um, and you're welcome. I, I appreciate you guys. Okay. We're going to have a, a couple more questions and then I'm probably going to let you guys uh, get back to your day. Cause you've probably honestly got better stuff to do than sitting here, listening to my chapping mouth chap. Uh, let's see. Cindy Humphrey says my hair is super fine and thin. Any tips for volume? I have a little longer than chin length, Bob. So uh, if you haven't already checked it out, I actually have a video all about how to create volume in thinner or finer hair. Um, so definitely look at that because I think there'll be some insight in there for you as well. With that said, a chin length bob or anything like anything in that scenario, um, obviously layers are going to be my first thing, my first go-to. Okay. I know, especially in thin, so guys, let me just, let me just back here up a little bit. I, I know, cause I get this in all these comments, right? I know thin, fine hair. 
I know, first of all, I know that there's a difference between thin and fine hair. I get it. <laughs> it's not my first rodeo. I'm fully aware of that. I also know that layering can be terrifying if you've got especially thinner hair. Finer hair, it depends on the density of it. Some people have no problem with layering, but some people can be very concerned about it. Now, if you have thin and fine hair, then it can be really scary and rightfully scary because it can go very wrong very quickly. So here's what I would tell you. I just did a video about how to appropriately cut a lob. The same process that you would use to cut that lob, you would use to cut layers into a bob shape, okay? Bobs are even gonna be a little bit easier than this because they're shorter, closer to the neckline. Therefore, closer to the neck means you can have more layering in certain areas and it's still gonna hold, it's not gonna look as thin at the bottom, right? As we get a little bit longer from that neckline, it starts to get a little bit more thin. We gotta be a little bit more conscientious of how many layers, how much we, layering we do down in here. But so watch that series on lobs because I think that's gonna, if you haven't already, I think that's gonna help you out a lot in understanding what I'm talking about. But layering is absolutely 99% of the time. Yes, there's like 1% of people where their hair is so thin and so fine that maybe in a very specific scenario, layering wouldn't be the best option. And I actually talk about that in the video that's coming up next Tuesday. I talk about that a little bit, but layering in the front, I would still always do, even on a bob shape. Okay, I know you wanna keep that corner, but a little bit of layering in the front is going to help create a little bit more openness around the face and create a little bit more volume. So think, a light, longer bang that connects lightly into the front, okay? So start there. Layering internally. So when I say internally, I mean everything basically from your behind your, your what we call a control point. So guys, if you put the, a comb on your head, okay? Where that comb leaves your head, right in the front, that's what we call a control point. Everything from that point forward is gonna come forward like a bang. Everything from to, at that point will go to the sides. Everything behind that point is gonna fall back. So that's to say you cut bangs and comb them all the way from the back and then you cut it. This is why that unicorn cut, home haircut is horrible, don't do it. But that's why when you comb all this stuff forward and you cut bangs, all you've done is cut these layers really short because they're not gonna come forward like bangs. The minute you take your head, they're gonna fall back, right? So this stuff, all of that stuff in the very, very front, you can layer that in, and still have some layers in the front and still keep that corner on that bob. Internally, so everything behind that, all of this stuff, that I would layer without question. The key is that you don't layer it too short. Now I explained this a second ago, but I'll explain it again, just in case you're just jump, jumping on here. An easy way to determine the right length on layers. I, I have a whole webinar that we did about how to avoid common home hair mistakes. So if you're doing your hair at home, coloring or cutting, there's a link in the description below. We'll take you to my webinar where we walk through the common mistakes and how to avoid them. And one of the most common mistakes is cutting layers too short. The way we avoid it is simply take the hair at your occipital bone. So this hair here, okay, mine's obviously short, so it won't reach. But grab that hair and pick that hair straight up, okay? When that comes up, then grab the hair at the top of your head and you're gonna pick that up. Now, if the hair in the back from the occipital bone, you want the hair here at the top of your head to be the same length or longer, but you don't want it to be shorter. If it's shorter, layers are too short. This is when you're gonna run into problems, okay? So keep this as a guide, pick that up. If you're sitting at your home right now with that bob and you pick that hair up and you pick this hair up, that's a little bunny you go, oh, you know what? This is a lot longer. I would cut that actually basically to about that occipital bone length. I would take that length down and break that up a little bit and that's gonna give us movement. Now, if we don't layer all of this hair right here, everything below recession to occipital bone. So all of this, if we leave that one length, you're still, even on fine hair, even on fine thin hair, you're still gonna have a strong line that comes forward. You're just gonna get volume and that line. All it's gonna do is actually make your hair look denser. Okay, so as long as we do it right, layers are like your best friend for volume. After that, it's all about product usage and the way that you actually style it. So I also have videos about how to style hair, how to create volume. Uh, it, watch those videos. Honestly, it's just, it's a step-by-step -step and it's going to make things a lot easier for you. Um, let's see. So what can I do? Okay. Hold on real quick. I want to make sure I don't miss too many of these guys. Sorry. Uh, see my husband from the other room, that guy is really smart. <laughs> verbal, verbal, verbal blowtorch. Your, your husband, your husband is way too nice. I don't know that I'm that smart. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate it. Uh, let's see. Dr. Sandra Wagdi Babawi. I am so sorry. Like, I, you guys, I'm horrible. I can barely read. Let's be real. See, I'm not that smart. 
uh, I so much apologize for, for destroying that name. Uh, but doctor, you said, thank you for all the info and tips. You're so welcome. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, let's see. Hello from beautiful Prince Edward Island. Hello. I'm a little bit jealous. And by that, I mean a lot. Um, let's see. What can I do to control my frizzy hair without heat? It always looks very dry. So, uh, doctor again, it depends on if your hair is curly or straight. Okay. Um, and it also depends on what's causing the dryness. So if you're, if, to me, dryness and frizz are two, actually, they're two different things. Dryness is more of like, it looks dry at the ends. It looks kind of broken at the ends. It's just, you know, feels limp and lifeless. And it's just kind of overall doesn't feel, it just feels dry. Frizz, you can still have healthy hair, right? That doesn't feel dry. It's not damaged per se, right? From chemicals or from over like heating or anything like that. Um, and still have frizz. So those to me are kind of two separate things that you would typically that you would even address separately. If we're talking about frizz, um, I was saying before that I've got a whole video that goes through what happens with frizz and why your hair gets frizzy. And there's actually quite a bit to it. It's not as blanket of a statement, um, especially if you're not using heat, because unfortunately, if I did have to blanket answer that, I would go to heat because heat's one of the few things that I can say more often than not, heat is one of the few things that's going to calm that frizz down on just about anybody. Aside from heat, if we're looking at, we're, then at that point, we're looking at trying to figure out what causes the frizz, like what truly causes it. Hair texture because your hair is changing. Is it the shampoo you're using being too strong for you? Is it the conditioner you're using? Is it products? Is it, you know, hormones? Like there's a lot of different things that can actually create that frizz in hair. We need to figure out where it's coming from before we can determine how to fix it, right? So it's just kind of, it's kind of like anything. If you're sick, we got to figure out what's causing the sickness before we can determine how to actually address those symptoms. Well, not address symptoms, but address the cause, right? Otherwise, if we're talking about just addressing the symptoms, then we're talking about essentially heat or product. If we're talking about heat and product, then obviously heat is going to be the number one thing because it's going to be kind of universal. Product is going to be based more on your hairstyle how much tolerance you have for oil, because usually the, I was saying this before, the amount of oil base in a product, watery texture, you're going to feel when you look at a product like pomades and stuff like that, or lotions, this kind of stuff, the more watery it's going to feel, the more shine it's going to have, the less control it's going to have. The more strength, like a, like a clay or a wax or something like that, it's going to typically have less shine, but it's going to have a lot more control. If you want some more kind of in the middle, which is why I say kind of like a lotion, because typically that's going to give you a little bit more control to control that frizz, lay that frizz down, while at the same time not having so much oil that it lays your hair flat. If you're looking at one of those products, then it's really going to be finding that range and then determining how much oil can I deal with? How much of this buildup, right? Not buildup because you usually get the water soluble, but day to day, I mean like feeling of buildup, feeling of oil and grease. How much of this can I feel is okay for the day and it's not going to bug me? If it's, especially because you're not drying it in. A lot of times putting an oil or something like that on your hair and then you dry it in with a flat iron or a round brush or anything like that, it takes some of that little bit of oily feeling out and leaves it a little bit softer. So some people it's like, oh, I can use this little lotion product because I don't really feel it once I dry it. But if I just let it air dry in, then I feel a little bit more and I don't like it. It's going to be a personal tolerance if we're just talking about addressing the symptom, addressing the symptom. but if we're addressing it, the cause, then it, it, we have to like do some research to figure out what's causing it. And then how do we address that specific thing? Because there are so many different little factors. If you were a client and you sat down on my chair, we would go through a lot of questions to try to figure out where is this coming from? You know, so yeah, frizz is, is it's a different thing than people think. It's unfortunately, it's not as quite as straightforward. There are some simple fixes and more often than not, like there are some base answers to that, if you will. Um, but they're still very blanket and it's not nearly as specific as I would want to be for you. Um, let's see, jumping down here real quick just to make sure what's, uh, Susan says, what's the best thing to use on new growth hair, broken hair, fly away hair. Okay. So new growth, broken hair and fly away. Um, so two, so three separate things, really new growth hair, the best thing to use. I'm assuming that you're just wanting something that's going to lay it down. Sprays work really well for that afterward, right? Dry your hair. First of all, you know, you're going to probably more often than not tilt your head over. I tell people to create volume. That's going to get those little hairs to stand straight up. So what you're going to have to do after that is a quick shot with the blow dryer, just to kind of try to get them to lay down a little bit without decreasing too much of that root lift that you're getting in the other hair and then spray and pat, you know, that that's one with, with the, it depends on how long those little fly away new, new growth hairs are too. Some are going to be easier when they're really short. They can be tough. You know, there's a lot of factors with that, but spray usually is a, is a pretty good way to go. Um, broken hair, Olaplex. More often than not, the reason hair breaks is because it 
the disulfide bonds break down. If you have a shoestring, for instance, you have a shoestring, it's not one string, it's one string that's comprised of say 100 strings. If 50 of those strings break, you still have a shoestring that's intact. However, it becomes much more susceptible to breaking, right? It's just weak. It doesn't hold bend because it just kind of flops over. It's not, it doesn't have the rigidity, it doesn't hold shape, all of those things. It, that would be similar to your hair breaking down. It breaks those disulfide down. Each hair has a bunch of these disulfide bonds. And as these bonds break, okay, your hair is going to have less life. It's what, when you've seen really bleached hair, that's still intact, but not it just lays flat. And it's just kind of like blah, and you can't do anything with it. That's hair. That's got a lot of disulfide bonds broken down and it doesn't have the ability to have the rigidity to create shape. And then it's very susceptible to breakage. So the best thing to do if your hair is breaking is use Olaplex number three specifically. Number three, number two, and number one are essentially the three, the three Olaplex products that have the ability to rebuild the disulfide bonds. But number three is the only one that you can buy as a consumer. So you would put that in your hair. It's going to rebuild those bonds and it's going to help your hair strengthen. I would use that a couple times a week. And then as your hair starts to get a little bit stronger, I would move to using it once a week after that, more as, as maintenance. When you're talking about, uh, sorry, I'm going back. When you're talking about, uh, let's see here. We had three different ones. I don't want to miss them. Uh, flyaway hair. Flyaway hair is kind of similar to the new growth hair. That's going to be more of just spraying stuff down or using some sort of, an, again, a pomade, some sort of wax-based product, something that's got a little bit of control to it. Um, starting with a foundational product. When I say foundational product, I typically mean products that are going to create some sort of volume in hair, gels, mousses, um, styling creams, stuff like that. So starting with something like that can help because it gives it a little bit of rigidity, right? It's a little bit of a foundation. And then using something afterward to just kind of hold that down like a spray or like a, like a pomade or something like that. Um, usually those are going to help depending on how short your hair is. Waxes do a great job. If it's longer, spray may be more your thing just because um, you're not trying to get it stiff. You just want something to kind of control it a little bit. Uh, let's see. Will you consider doing a series on hair extensions? Pretty please. Lori, I actually am considering doing a, a hair extensions video. Uh, I'm working on it. It's really tough. So guys, um, just to, just to kind of understand how this works, just so you know, if I'm not creating a video on something yet, if I've had a lot of people ask about specific videos and I really do want to create them. So please understand that they're not going missed. Uh, it's not unnoticed. I definitely want to create them. If I want to grow this channel, I have to be strategic about the videos that I put out because the algorithm is only going to work in my favor if I work for it, right? So I have to be creating videos right now that are pretty specific and I'm trying to test a little bit and see what I can get away from. And I'm, I'm, I am so excited to say like, you know, this, this channel, I was looking for, you know, at the very beginning of this year, I wanted to hit, my goal was to hit a hundred thousand subscribers by the end of the year. And I, I mean, honestly, I wasn't sure if I could do it. <laughs> and I'm at like 98,100. So I don't know if I'm going to hit it by the end of the year, but I've been really, really, really trying to, to, to treat this channel like a business because when I treat it like a business, it grows. The more it grows, the more I have freedom to talk about more stuff. The more stuff I talk about, the more benefit I can give to you as a viewer. So I want to be able to answer all of these questions in videos and do videos on all of these topics. But right now, if I've only got a few people that watch it, it kills the algorithm. And then it just basically mutes my channel a bit. So I have to be thought, I have to think about what I'm putting out right now so that I can get enough views that it tells the algorithm, Hey, this channel is basically in short form. This channel is worth watching. We should send these, these videos out to more people. So there's a lot of stuff that goes behind the scenes that when people talk about YouTube, they just don't know. And I'm not growing this just for fun. Like I love doing it, but it will become a business for me. If I'm completely frank with you, it is part of a, a plan that I have to create a business that allows me more freedom. So I do have to think if I want to grow this, I've got to be a bit strategic. So don't think that I'm not, um, that I'm ignoring you because I'm not, I really do. Want, I will do one about extensions. I will definitely get into more curly hair videos. I really want to do that. And I tested the waters with a curly hair video a while back, but I just need more curly hair. people. It's the cart in front of the horse. It's really tough. I have to do curly hair videos to get more curly hair people to watch. Right. But if I do, <laughs> I need more curly hair video people to watch before I can do more curly hair videos. Hmm. Figure that one out. So here's how you help. Tell your friends, maybe not even curly haired friends, just friends in general about the channel. Let's allow it to grow. As it grows, I have more freedom to create more topics and talk about more topics for you guys. And that's ultimately what I want to get to. I just, I'm trying to be good about it. So I apologize, but yes. Um, let's see. Thank you for trying to guide me on how to think more about the cause anyway. You're, you're very welcome. I hope that helped a little bit. I know it wasn't a very straightforward answer, so I apologize for that. 
Uh, let's see. I've never, Susan says, Justin, I've never used hot irons. Um, I've never used hot irons every day. I'm going to start using them at 54 years of age, but my hair, well, it's dead. Let's just say that it's time to cut it off, but I agree with you a billion percent. Um, yeah. So this isn't a question, but it does raise a question that I, I want to talk real quickly about. I see a lot of people that are really, really, really concerned about using heat on their hair, especially from irons, um, because of the concern of damage. So let me just preface this by saying that yes, flat irons, curling irons, any sort of iron that delivers that amount of heat is going to be damaging. But here's the thing that I think a lot of people miss. Everything you do to your hair on some level is damaging your hair. The question isn't rather not what you're doing is damaging, in my opinion. The question is, is this particular damage getting me a result that's worth it? And does the result outweigh the damage or does the damage outweigh the result? Like here is the, the space that I think we need to pay more attention to. And, and let, me, let me break this down so we kind of understand this more. Flat irons are, yeah, they're damaging, but you know what else is damaging? Blow dryers. Blow dryers today get hotter than they used to. It used to be when I first started cutting hair that what made a good blow dryer a good blow dryer was the amount of air that it released, right? So you had these blow dryers like, oh, this one blows way harder than this one. This is a better dryer. Now we've moved into an area where we just get hotter. So the more heat that this thing produces, the better the blow dryer is on most levels. That's what people, oh, this thing's got, it's ionic, but it gets super damn hot. The problem with this has become that even though these blow dryers have all of these great things with them that's supposed to be less damaging the hair, using them incorrectly is extremely problematic. So what will happen is body mechanics will tell people to use a blow dryer and a round brush in a certain way or a brush in a certain way. And so usually what will say what will happen is they'll go, well, I'm going to round brush my hair. So they'll take this brush and they'll put it in their hair and then they want to hold their elbow low and their shoulder down because this is comfortable, right? And then they've got this hair wrapped around this brush and they've got this blow dryer and it's hitting the hair directly on the hair, not up the hair because this is going to cause frizz or down the hair because now I'm lifting my elbow up and this feels uncomfortable. So they do this. This blowing air directly at that hair like that causes more damage that I see in the salon. I see more breakage from that than people that know how to efficiently use a flat iron. So even though this seems like it's not gonna be as big of a deal, it's every bit as big of a deal as a flat iron, if not more in most cases. And that is the thing that I think people are missing. Not just using, a, I'm just using this as an example. You doing color, the wrong kind of color too often can be extremely damaging. Using the wrong kind of conditioner, using a strong conditioner too often, a, a conditioner protein in your hair too often can damage your hair. There are a lot of little things that we can do that are very damaging to hair that are not even related to heat. So to me, if we can say, well, hey, look, my end goal is that I create a style that looks like this and this is what I want. I want my hair to look smooth. I want it to be polished. I want this shape but I don't want it to be damaged. Then I say, well, what can we do to get you there with the least amount of damage? But maybe that means that we watch the shampoo and conditioner you're using. We watch the way that you're blow drying your hair. And instead of you blow drying it like this, we show you a way that's less damaging, by far less damaging, that gets you the same result. And you actually use an iron. And overall, you're damaging your hair less than you were before. And we're getting you to the place, even though we add in an iron or a hot tool into the mix. All of this is just to say that there's a lot of things that cause damage. Irons are one of them, but there's a lot of other things that seem far less damaging that are absolutely as damaging that you may not do this and think, oh man, I'm doing my hair this massive justice. In reality, if you took this out of the equation and added this, you'd probably be better off and you'd get a better look, right? So that's where I'm going with that off of my high horse or my, 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 my soapbox now, but just, just so that we know. Um, all right, you guys, less product is better than, uh, Susan says less product is better than more more right and what's the number one thing to have in your hair before using hot air hot hair item thermal spray uh correct and sea cell will kill your hair okay sorry i'm 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 not, <laughs> I'm not very good at reading so i gotta read this again so less product is better than more product right okay um less product is not necessarily more than is not necessarily better than more product. It depends on the product. So for instance, my fat hair that I have for volume, I actually created a whole video to show people you need to use enough of it. And the reason is because if that particular product, if you only use a little bit of it, 
you're not going to get the volume that you want, but you'll get texture in your hair. If you use more of it, you'll actually get the volume with the same amount of texture. Now you are right in that mo more often than not, many cases, less is more because a lot of products will build up and they create, not build up over time, but just build up in the hair while you're drying it or while you're applying it. And then just all of a sudden get too gummy or too greasy or too flattening, just too much product for the hair. But that is very product specific, not application specific. And less is better only, is, only if it's enough. <laughs> Does that make sense? What I mean by that is, again, less is better if the product is being used efficiently and effectively. So if you're using it the correct way, i.e. working it from roots all the way through mid shaft, all the way through ends, and you have enough to get from mid shaft through ends because that's what it needs to create volume, for instance, then yes, less could be better as long as there's enough in there. You don't need to add more once you get that coated just to add more to it. But that is still product to product. So I don't want to say that general rule of thumb maybe, but um, there are some products that would, that would go against that. Um, okay, sorry, let's see. Uh, how do you feel about the Dyson being 550 with no heat? Um, are people at their out of their mind or is it phenomenal? Like, so are you talking about the Dyson blow dryer or the Dyson flat iron? So the flat iron doesn't go to 550. Um, the blow dryer doesn't go to 550 either. So I, or maybe talking about money price. Um, and with no heat, they both have heat. So I'm a little confused on that. So here's what I will say about Dyson products. I am a absolute firm believer that you do not always get what you pay for. I, there's, I'm sorry, but when George Armani throws out a t-shirt with his logo on it and it's $150, it's the same cotton t-shirt that I could buy anywhere else for $10. You're not getting $150 worth of shirt. Okay. <laughs> you got a $150 shirt that you should have got for 10 bucks, but it's got a brand name on it. Like that is not getting your money's worth. Not Armani suit. Yeah. You know, they're well-made like, yeah, it's, you're getting a little bit more for that. Dyson, you really do get what you pay for. And the only reason I knew this, because I did not believe this actually, but when Dyson reached out to me to do a collaboration and I actually did a video for them regarding their corral iron, when they reached out, I was able to jump on a Zoom call and talk to corporate and really walk through the process of like, why is this special? What did you guys do with this iron? Answer this question for me. Well, what about this? And I really just got to pick their brains and listen to like, what went into this iron? And it made it, ab they made it abundantly clear that the amount of research and development that goes into those products is no joke. I mean, it, they legitimately, it is a scenario where every cent that you spend is on purpose. Like they, you really do get your money's worth. I think the, the Corral iron is an incredible flat iron. I use it in the salon every day. The blow dryer, I have one at home, have one in the salon. I bought these products prior to our, my collaboration with them. I bought them with my own money. I did not like, they didn't just give me the products. They did afterward for the collaboration. But before that, I had been using them in the salon. That's why I agreed to the collaboration because I already loved their product. So I bought them and I bought them originally with the idea that I was really like, I don't think this is gonna be that good. And I'm gonna film a video about it and I'm gonna call it out because you know what? That's a really expensive blow dryer. I don't think it's worth it. And was it faster than other blow dryers? Like everybody said, did it dry the hair faster? No, I did a video, not in my opinion. I didn't see that it was faster at all. I timed it. I was very specific. Like I really put it through its paces and I don't feel like it was faster. Maybe a couple seconds faster, but sorry, on a 10 minute blow dryer, a couple seconds means nothing, right? So I didn't see that it was faster. However, the blow dryer, the same time it took to blow dry one side of a head with one dryer and the, and the other side of the head with the, with the Dyson took the same amount of time. But what I did not expect, and I had no idea this was happening. I recognized this. After we got done, after I saw the before and afters, I was like, oh my gosh, the Dyson smoothed the hair out so much better. I did the blow dry the exact same way. There was nothing different, but it, the way it polished hair, it looked, it looked noticeably different. And that's when I was like, okay, this is a different machine. So yes, there are a lot of like little aspects to theirs. They're, like they're built well. Um, they're just, you feel them like everything about them. You can tell that this is, this is a high priced piece of equipment. So I don't think they're for everybody. I don't think everybody needs them. However, if you're thinking it and you are in the market for one, I do believe that you're going to get what you pay for. They are a phenomenal product and I can't, I don't have anything bad to say about them. I mean, I, I really just don't aside from, I wish there were less money because I, I don't have to spend that money either, <laughs> but they are really good. Um, what, how, what hair color line do you like? So for me, we use L'Oreal in the salon. We've also used Wella in the salon. 
Um, we use Shades EQ, Redken, which is a L'Oreal product. So we use a few of them. I've used a bunch of I've used a bunch of other ones, and there's other kind of off brands. So more often than not, if you're at a salon, a lot of times you're going to see L'Oreal and you're going to see Wella. Like those are two very popular brands within larger salons. Um, so that's probably going to be the way most people lean. There's a lot of other smaller brands out there that are that are working their way through that are like owned by a lot of them are owned by L'Oreal or Wella. Um, so there's a lot of other brands out there. I mean, I like them, but I've just used L'Oreal now for so long that it's just kind of what I lean to. And unfortunately, I will tell you that most stylists, and, and I don't want to talk for everybody here, but I will say that, you know, all the stylists that I've worked around, we get pretty comfortable with one. You learn, you kind of learn a brand, right? And then you kind of use that brand. And it's not to say there aren't other great brands. Well, as a great brand, there's a lot of great products out there, but you kind of get used to this one thing and how it works. And in the salon, you don't have a lot of time, like you don't want to spend a week or two weeks relearning a new product line. You're like, I'm comfortable with this line. It does what I need it to do. I, I rely on it. I can, I can trust it. My client comes in. This is the color. That's gonna, you don't want to be like, feel like you're practicing on a client, if that makes sense. So people will tend to kind of stay where they're at. And, you know, they don't, not, not a lot of styles will jump around. I'm sure there's some out there, but not a lot will jump around. I've used L'Oreal for a long time and I love it. I've gotten great results with it. I mean, I, I love all the different, uh, the different brands within the L'Oreal lines. Um, but that doesn't mean there aren't other great products out there. As far as at home stuff, uh, if you're talking about actually doing your hair at home, we, uh, if you didn't know, we do a webinar and we actually talk about L'Oreal, Clairol, Schwarzkopf, um, different, different color brands. And the reason we talk about those specifically, like I like those three for doing it at home. The reason being is because they all have both uh, consumer lines as well as professional lines. And the, the benefit in that is that those companies have seen both sides of the market. And that means that they, they, the, the R and D that goes into all of their products, they're stealing some from each other. Right. So it's not just a product that only knows consumer having that professional brand behind it. It's just a little bit like one more notch of control, I guess, or, or quality control, if you will. Um, so I like those three, but the one you would choose honestly will be based on your skin tone, oddly enough, because each of those has a slightly different base tone to them. So um, I actually have to look at the chart on which one it is. I honestly can't remember off the top of my head, uh, but one is cooler, Typically, like their, their their colors will have a tendency to be a little bit cooler base. Um, I believe L'Oreal is cooler. I actually have to look at the home stuff because I use the stuff at the salon. It's different. Um, but one's cooler, one's warmer, and one's more for, for neutral. Schwarzkopf, I believe, is neutral. Uh, so either way, understanding your skin tone, which actually in the webinar, for webinar, I think there's a link in the description below. You can check it out. We talk about how to determine your skin tone so you know which one of those to try. Okay, but at the salon, uh, L'Oreal, Wella, Shades of Q, all that stuff. Um, and then a bunch of random ones, depending on what, what we're doing too. So, uh, let's see, just says my gray hair doesn't cover well, but I don't want to damage my hair. Uh, so when you talk about gray hair coverage, thing, if you're using a permanent product to, it depends on how much gray you have. If you've got a lot of gray, you're going to need something strong enough to actually, if it's not strong enough, it's just not going to cover it. So that's why, you know, you won't always get the coverage like a semi-permanent, which uses a lower developer, like six volume or nine volume, which is a less aggressive developer. So it's going to typically, like a six volume will leave your hair shiny and it'll leave it feeling conditioned. It'll be great. Then you move into most permanent products, which will use like a 20 volume and it's just a little bit more aggressive and it feels a little bit more damaged. The, the damage is from a lot of things. And this kind of goes back to my other point about the ways that we damage your hair that we don't think about. So if you're feeling like you've got gray hair and you want to color your hair, just understand this. First of all, darker colors are always going to look shinier. Okay. So there's damage and then there's looking damaged. And then there's what's creating the damage. So if you want your hair to not necessarily look damaged, then darker colors are going to look shinier and they're going to have a little bit more luster in them. And that will tend to look healthier. Okay. So keeping that in mind in the first place. So we start out the gate right that. If you're going lighter, like if you're trying to go into blondes or something like that, then it could look a little bit more damaged simply because of the way it reflects light. It's going to have a tendency to look more damaged. So keep that in mind out of the get-go. As far as the color, there are colors out there, color lines out there that are going to feel a little bit less damaged. They're going to feel a little bit softer in the hair. Um, I don't have any problems with the L'Oreal stuff that we use, but I haven't used all of them. So I know there's some that are going to feel a little bit more damaged, and a little bit more gritty when you're done with it. Um, but I, I honestly couldn't tell you which one that would be. So L'Oreal won't do that. I know that. All right. So there's that. And then there's different lines though within L'Oreal. So it's going to be a matter of which one you use, but you're going to need to use the one that's got enough pigment to actually color your gray. 
So yeah, I mean, start there and then also pay attention to what you're doing with your hair outside of the color. So make sure that you're not doing anything else that's damaging your hair because if you, you might be doing something else, you, again, using a shampoo or conditioner is too strong for your hair and you go, oh, well, you know what? I don't want to color my hair because that's going to be damaging. Well, if I just switch out my shampoo, use, you know, maybe a new wash shampoo from Hair Story and, you know, it's a shampoo and conditioner. It doesn't dry my hair out. It's great for my hair. Everything's good. Golden. Well, now this damage session that what was creating the damage over here is mitigated. That concern is out of the way. Now this color really isn't even damaging my hair as much as that shampoo was. So overall, I'm now able to do color and everything else is good. And I'm getting, even though I'm technically damaging my hair, I'm damaging it less than it was before because the shampoo and conditioner I was using was too strong. So keep in mind that, that that's kind of what I was getting at before. There's a lot of things that damage hair. So pay attention to what you're doing that could be damaging it and then figure out what your end result, what you want your end result to be. I might ask, answer one more question then I'm gonna, I gotta leave you guys alone because this is, you guys are probably gonna get bored of me here. Um, so let's see. Uh, Lori says, what have you learned about hair color on people with allergies or sensitivities? Any brand suggestions? Okay, that's, that is a really, really good question. And the simple answer is that, <laughs> again, it's totally person to person. So there are definitely products that we've used in the past that are a little bit more um, aggressive towards people with sensitive scalps, right? So if you have a tendency to be uh, have allergy or allergic reactions to products, then there were products that we've used, but I haven't used them honestly in so long that I wouldn't even, the reason I'm not saying the name is because I don't want, it's been so long since I've used them that they might be nothing like that anymore. So I don't want to be like, don't use this brand because this is what I saw when it's like, that's not true at all. Right. So it would just be doing a disservice to the brand. And I don't really think it's fair to them. And I haven't used them in long enough that I don't know if, if they have those problems and all at this point or not. So I don't want to say that um, again with L'Oreal stuff. I haven't seen, so we've been, we switched over to L'Oreal maybe 18 years ago, roughly 18 years ago, um, maybe even a little bit, maybe 20 years ago. And since then I have seen maybe two clients in the salon that were sent that, that had sensitive reactions to it, maybe two. And we use a few, um, we use, so L'Oreal has a handful of different, different uh, products, right? So they have Majora. We've used all of those and I have any of them that really caused a concern. So do it. Um, there's certain little things like around the hairline you can do with like barriers um, that will help protect if somebody's got some sensitive skin, um, keeping it off the scalp, depending on what you're doing. So if you're just putting on all over color, then you're not going to keep it off the scalp because it's going to have to color the roots, right? But if you're, you know, keeping it away from the scalp because you're doing highlights or something like that, just leaving it off the scalp a little bit, stuff like that can help. Um, staying away from, from stuff that's, if you know that you're allergic to something specific, like a, like bleaches or something like that, if that causes you more concern, then definitely not putting bleach on the scalp. Even the scalp safe bleaches may not be a good option for you because the probability is that you're going to have a reaction to it. So there, there are a few things, but usually it's going to be brand. I feel like that I'm seeing more of that with, and I haven't seen anything with the L'Oreal stuff that we've been using in so long that I had that problem, thankfully. So yeah, again, I don't know if that, if that helped <laughs> much, but uh, um, let's see. And one more, you guys, I can't even stop. I actually enjoy this kind of stuff. So you guys are in trouble. I apologize. <laughs> uh, let's see. So um, is this, so Justin, is this true? Any ash in hair dye? I have medium brown hair. They say, stay away, well, stay away from the ashes. Is that myth or true? Sincerely. Um, okay. So medium, I have in hair dye, I have medium brown hair. They say, okay. Stay away from ash only if ash doesn't work with your skin tone. So, so ash is another way of saying cool, right? So you have, let's say you have brown, okay, you have a medium brown. Well, then you're going to have brown, but you're also, depending on what color line you use, or, or not even what color line you use, depending on what, what color you use within that line. So I might have a six, what do you call it? 6.3, which means in our line, it would be six, level six brown, 0.3 means plus gold. So the base to that is gold. It's a little bit warmer. Or I might have a 6.1. So the six is the level of brown, but then the 0.1 is an actual blue. So it's six ash, right? It's a little bit ashier, bluer, cooler. 
So those are going to look the same level of brown, medium brown, but or medium dark brown, but one is going to have a warmer base and one is going to have a cooler or a quote unquote could be ashier base. A lot of times the ashier base will have a tendency to, uh, people will call green bases ashy, but blue bases can also be ashy. So if they're telling you stay away from green, they might be looking at your skin tone and saying, well, you know what? You have a warmer skin tone. You shouldn't be doing anything too cool. So stay away from this ash, stay more in the warm tones. But if you have a neutral skin tone or if you have a cooler skin tone, and I don't know yours, um, again, one way you can check that is just look at this, the jewelry you wear. That's one easy way. If you wear a lot of silver, the probability is that you have a cooler skin tone. If you wear silver and gold, you're likely neutral. If you wear mainly gold, you're likely warm. If you wear a lot of silver, you can wear some of that, that uh, cooler base, and it's going to be fine for you. So I don't believe that this is a blanket term that everybody should be using. I don't think that everybody should say, hey, stay away from ash. The bigger concern when people say stay away from ash is that ash can look green. So there is that, that, prob that probability, but that's not all ashes. That's just that ash, not all ash is green, but all green would be considered ashy. That makes sense? So just the word ashy, this is why I say terminology within hairdressers is dangerous because there's so many different terms. What you want to stay away from most of the time, most people, green is not the best base to lean into and some natural tones. So some different, different companies like Majorelle, L'Oreal, right? All these different brands. Some of them, if you look at their quote unquote natural, meaning just like a six N, which is six natural, those tones or those colors, some of them have a tendency to look a little bit quote unquote ashier, a little bit greener. And so some people say, well, don't use that. It's an ugly, it's an ugly color. What we want to do is mix that. Even if we want cool, we want to mix that with something else to not make, to cut some of that green out. Or we want to warm that up a little bit. So we'll mix that with something that's a little bit warmer. So it cuts some of that green out. So it's not so ashy, quote unquote. Um, so that might be what they're referring to, but it's still to me green. Yeah. Stay away from green. It's usually just not that pretty, but that doesn't mean stay away from cool or typically ashy tones. Ashy could mean other things to other stylists. Um, okay. So... And it says, I couldn't sleep and I saw that you were alive. So I decided to listen in, even though I don't really style my hair, even everything has been interesting and I didn't even notice it was already. Well, thank you. That, <laughs> I really appreciate that. That, that means a lot. That is, that's huge. Um, okay. You guys, I have, I've, I've got to let this go. So uh, I appreciate you guys so much for hanging out. I hope this maybe answered some of your questions, but uh, I do want to say this before we go real quickly. Um, so next week I've got a video on Tuesday coming out. Yeah, Tuesday, and it'll be about, uh, um, so I'm actually going to be talking about long hair. What I'm going to do is I'm going to explain like a three-step process on how to determine the best haircut for you. And first of all, understand that, um, and I'll talk about this in the video, but understand that when I say the best haircut, there's not only one haircut. Really what this is going to do is allow you, and this doesn't just work for long hair, but I do kind of speak specifically to long hair, but you can use this process regardless of the hair length, okay? So keep that in mind. But what it does is it explains like many times clients will be like, well, I want to change, but I don't know what to do. Well, here are the steps to help you determine what direction you are going to want to head in. And then you can take these steps and I'll explain how in the video, take these steps to a stylist or, you know, if you're going to do it at home and use these steps to figure out, okay, here's the direction I want to head. And here's how I actually take this information and either convey this to my stylist or use this to determine what I'm going to do with my hair. So that's what that video is going to be about the next week. I'm going to bring out a video and it may or may not be my Tuesday upload has nothing to do with hair at all. This is an absolute sideball of a video. Um, I'm actually haven't even filmed it yet. I'll be filming on Wednesday, next Wednesday. Um, and I don't, <laughs> I don't know. It, it's, it's just nothing to do with hair. So I don't know how it's going to do, um, but I think it's important. And I'm, I'm really fortunate in that I get to team up uh, with a, a friend of mine who, um, you guys may have seen her. If you ever watch animal planet, um, she was, uh, she had a show called, uh, Amanda to the rescue. She's an incredible girl. She rescues animals. She rescues dogs, special needs dogs. And so they had a couple of years. Um, she wasn't on this year because of COVID, but she had a couple of years, a couple of seasons running of, of her show. And she did great. And she reached out to me the other day and she wanted me to film a video, um, with her because her and a doctor have teamed up to, Basically, she's hearing impaired, and so there's a whole thing going on with hearing and with hearing impaired people and how expensive hearing aids are. And, 
and uh, it, there's just this whole realm around it. So I don't want to tell all the story yet, but they've done something pretty incredible. A little, I guess you call it a Christmas miracle that um, they've asked me if I would film and create a video for. Big deal. Little, <laughs> I'll be completely honest. It's a little, I'm a little anxious about it because it's like a really huge moment for somebody. And I kind of don't want to be the person to screw the moment up, right? <laughs> it's like you want to tell that story really, really, really well because for this one person, it's going to change her life. So, yeah, I think it's going to be good. I'm excited. So you should probably check it out. I don't know why it makes me emotional, <laughs> but yeah, I think it'll be good. So it's going to change somebody's life for the better. And I think that's what we need, especially right now with everything going on. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> on that note, I'm going to let you guys go. You guys, thank you very much for hanging out. Hopefully uh, you'll check that video out. I think you'll like it. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys soon. Yeah. <laughs> Take care now.